Friends, I, I think it's rather obvious that we live in a world right now with competing views and um, competing worldviews that is kind of vying for our attention. Um, lucky for us, though, there's 24-7 commentary on that as well, depending on uh, where we look. And it can feel, I think right now in particular, like there is zero stability in the midst of our lives. Where do we turn? What are we looking for? How do we know what is true and what is not true? And I think it's this pliability of truth in today's world that upsets the normal places we have historically found shelter and comfort. And our dependence on social media doesn't help, right? Um, It seems to exaggerate the problem because we all have friends who seem to be both experts on the viruses and experts on the danger of vaccines and also experts now on foreign policy. Um, Somehow they can wear all three hats at the same time. Um, And it's in this space that we see worldviews kind of colliding on an ongoing basis. Take into account that there are media conglomerates that fudge toward, well, the bottom line, because their business is first, and those we want to trust seem um, unsure about where we're headed, and I think we're desperate as a people for some solid ground to stand on, right? We're desperate to just be like, can I just stand here without it shifting underneath us? I think that's also what makes the changing church so hard, <laughs> Because even those spaces that we have grown accustomed to to always remaining the same, even in the midst of, um, of the world shifting around us, we, we desperately want spaces of comfort to not change at all. And we know that the church is indeed changing. But it doesn't, this change really doesn't change our trajectory or what we are called to be as a people of faith. We are called to really look past the noise, not to not listen, but look past the noise and find our meaning, our grounding in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is easier said than done. Because what does that actually look like? What does it mean to live a life that is grounded in the gospel? We want some assurances. We are desperate for proof. We need good news, good news that we can touch and experience and share with one another. And so our new series, Evidence, is is an opportunity for us to see our faith as this kind of stable foundation, right? Not only how does our faith invite change within us, but how can the gospel of Jesus Christ become the bedrock of our life? What does a faithful life actually look like? And how do we know we are indeed on the right path? Evidence is a series that will examine the outcomes of what believing in the gospel produces. And in a world that devalues facts, we want a faith that produces fruit. We want proof that believing in the gospel creates not only change within ourselves, but also change within our communities. So to begin this three-week series, we're going to be in the book of Galatians in the fifth chapter. I'm going to be actually, I added some verses, so I'll be reading verse 1 and then verses 13 through 25. And Paul is writing to, uh, to the churches in Galatia, which was a province in the Roman Empire, central modern-day Turkey. And uh, there is tension and dissent uh, within these communities, and it's risen out of this this challenge of uh, of community. What role does Jewish law play, and um, how are Christian communities supposed to behave under this notion of Jewish law? And this is what Paul says. In verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, 
become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the work of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and and things like these. I'm warning you, as I have warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. For the word of God, for, for the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock, our bedrock, and our redeemer. May we find solid ground in the midst of a turbulent world. And may that solid ground give us the confidence we need to live out our faith, which produces fruit. Amen. So right before I moved back to Texas, I was in uh, Colorado. I was serving as a chaplain at a hospital, but uh, because of my schedule, I had long kind of breaks, and I had this opportunity arise. My friend Paul, uh, who I went to seminary with, uh, his whole f- part of his family was from Omaha in Nebraska, and, and every year Paul would return to Omaha uh, for the College World Series a baseball uh, tournament for, for college teams, and so Paul Paul invited me uh, to go out to Omaha and spend a week uh, with his family. And so I brought my good friend Derek along with me, and Derek had pitched at TCU, and TCU was in the College World Series that year, so we were both very excited uh, to see them play. But there was a deal kind of involved in this. We, we got tickets to the game, and we got a free place to stay, but we had to help Paul and his uncle work uh, Paul's uncle's bar called Polly's. And so uh, that was the deal. We got to go to the games for free, but we had to work the bar. And so it kind of unfolded like this. We would be at Polly's uh, at some sort of farm animal trough on their porch, and we would uh, be passing out uh, beverages, and then uh, we'd stay up way too late, and then we'd go to Paul's grandma's house and sleep on our dining room floor, and then we'd wake up really, really early in the morning, return and clean the whole facility the best we can, and then we'd go to some day baseball games, and then we'd turn back to Polly's and start it all over again, right? Like a wash, rinse, and repeat kind of deal. Uh, and so I, I tell you about this uh, because, one, it was a long, long, wonderful, but very long week. Um, and I, I tell you about it not because I think it, this experience is a manifestation of the Apostle Paul's desire of the flesh, although... If you're paying attention at Polly's late at night, and you're playing this Desire of the Flesh bingo game, I'm sure you could have easily uh, filled out a couple of cards, right? It got a little, a little wild at night. Uh, I tell you this because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that the stickiest and dirtiest floor I've ever been on was at Polly's. <laughs> it was like... Um, 
It's hard to describe, actually. Uh, Think of a sticky floor, and then, like, think of a really, really sticky floor, and then uh, think of something completely different, and that's kind of what it was, right? And so every morning, we would have to mop this floor, and we would mop it, and we would scrape it, and we would spray Lysol on it, and then we'd mop it again, and we'd scrape it, and we could not actually make it not sticky. It was permanently uh, a sticky floor, And, and basically, our goal, I think, was just to keep the floor from becoming some sort of makeshift tarmac in the middle of the desert. And I could even hear Derek, he'd be on the other side of the establishment, like 2,000 square feet away, and he would start walking towards me to fill up his mop bucket, and I could hear him all the way over there, you know, like, I can't even make the noise. That's the best squeaking noise I got, right? So it was just a really disgusting, sticky floor, right? And I'm going to be honest with y'all, this is kind of how I feel when I read Paul's uh, fifth chapter here in Galatians. I feel like we're in the midst of this kind of sticky environment because we continue to have the same kind of argument in the midst of the epistles. This really challenging thing exists, and there is no hermeneutical scrubbing that can remove the sticky reality that we are both saved by grace— Saved by grace, and our lives should look different. It is a tension that exists throughout Paul's writing. And regardless of how we read Paul or interpret Paul or even how we ignore Paul at times, we cannot square this reality very well that we are both saved by grace, it's not our own doing, but our lives should not look like our old life before a relationship with Jesus Christ. That grace is best understood in changed living. But I think the questions that always linger, are we saved if we only exhibit a little bit of change? Or what if we don't see any change in our life? Are we saved? And here in Galatians, the floor is indeed really, really sticky because Paul is furious that agitators and his opponents in the faith are continuing a narrative that he finds repulsive, right? That being that, being that Jewish law must be observed for folks to be not only welcomed into the community, but then to hold leadership positions within the community, to find flourishing uh, reality within the community. And Paul is very clear from the the very beginning of this fifth chapter in verse one he says for freedom christ has set us free and in these few short words paul conveys both the heart of the gospel and a missiology we are made free we experience freedom for a reason Paul expands on this by suggesting that those who are free should then what? Enslave themselves to one another, which seems like the opposite of freedom. Apparently, Christian freedom doesn't mean living an unencumbered life. For Paul, for the Galatians, and for us, Freedom doesn't give us a life free from the encumbrances of life. Freedom isn't the absence of entanglements. Rather, we begin to see that the entanglements are the rich soil in which freedom gains true meaning. Ultimately, Paul is concerned with what our freedom in Christ produces in our life. And as we continue to read Galatians, we begin to see uh, that at the heart of this rather sticky issue is how we behave in the midst of this freedom and how we behave has a direct impact on the relationships that exist in our lives. For Paul, this is all about relationships. Paul says as much in verse 14, the entire law is summed up in the single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If this is true, and I think most of us would say, yeah, we believe that, 
Our freedom in Christ then prioritizes and reorders our life, and our relationships should then look different. I think often we come to these sort of lists with a stark line drawn between the desires of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit, this kind of distinct difference that exists between the two. Uh, and it's often defined as the material world over here and the spiritual realm over here. We either have the flesh or we are following the spirit. We either are paying attention to the desires of the body or we're cultivating the good of God in our soul. We either have desire or we practice restraint. But I think that's too easy and not particularly helpful to live in that kind of dichotomy, that dualism. Paul isn't making a claim here about our humanity, our essence, right? That's not what Paul is doing. It's not a matter of oncology for Paul in this letter to uh, the churches in Galatia. Rather, it is an issue of ethics. The concern here is not solely with the flesh and our desires. Rather, it's about how our desires are often disorder, disordered and unchecked. And when that happens in our life, we make ourselves the center of our own reality. We become the center of our life. We become our own gods. And so when we want intimacy, we look for it in a life that is filled with lust. When we want an encounter with the divine, instead of taking the slow spiritual path that Jesus shows us, we create idols for ourselves. When we want joy, instead of cultivating it within our lives, we walk around boasting about how much we do in hopes that it will bring us joy. But in fact, Paul is certain this reality is wildly known, this difference between between the flesh and the spirit. Paul is speaking to something that folks have already picked up on. This idea that there are deep desires within our bodies is not new. Paul's list is similar to others in the Greco-Roman world. It's similar to Plato and Aristotle, right? They had similar lists. But where Paul changes the trajectory he says that an appropriate response to our upside-down priorities and desires is what sets the gospel apart from the world. Paul knows we don't reject outright our fleshy desires, nor do we completely give in to them. Rather, we are to desire properly. Intimacy with others and the divine finding of joy and the unfettering ourselves from the weight of the world is found in the right ordering of our lives, a proper balance between loving God, loving others, and loving ourselves. And that's hard. That's hard work. Like, really hard. I've found that it's a lot easier uh, to ensure a plant produces no fruit just look at our garden, then cultivate plants that produce a bounty. And that's why we're starting here this morning, because before we can make any progress on this front of living lives that produce fruit, we must come to a place where we step firmly on the non-sticky ground of the gospel we must discern what God has done on our behalf and claim it as our own, that God through Christ, through his ministry and life, death and resurrection, shapes and forms how we love our neighbors. And loving our neighbors reveals how much God loves us. We start by trusting in the gospel. It's not by the good works that the rich young ruler can find his way into the kingdom. Rather, it's like the prodigal son. We must set our face towards home and God, and in that welcome and forgiveness, we are set free. But if good works isn't the key to salvation, it surely becomes the mark of it. If we are forgiven and do not forgive, if we are loved but cannot love, what are we even doing here? We're kidding ourselves, right? 
You shall know them by their fruits. That's what Jesus says. And here the meek and mild, let the children come to me, Jesus, turns into a bit of a lion when he says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There is an expectation that once you come into a relationship with God and you understand God's grace at work in your life, that your life will then reflect that grace to others. So Paul here in Galatians is only echoing Jesus, right? Paul is essentially holding a mirror up to the Galatians and saying, look at your life. Does it indeed reflect that of Christ? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these there is no such law. Do our own lives reflect that reality? Would people describe you as someone who loves, has joy, acts kindly, practices goodness and faithfulness and gentleness, and do you have self-control? Not on Monday, usually. Or Tuesday. Um, (laughs) Paul's words here then become really a barometer for us. They reveal to us how far (laughs) left on this journey of sanctification we have to go. But here is maybe the best news for us this morning. We cannot do this on our own. You cannot will yourself to display uh, such fruits of of the Spirit in your own life on a daily basis. God knows this reality, and so God, (laughs) in all of that divine wisdom, sends the Spirit, the advocate, to intercede on our behalf. The Spirit then works on us and changes us, and it does indeed take time, and we are but a rock in a river being washed over from God's grace over and over and over again until we are refined to reflect that reality that God's grace is abundant and not scarce, that it can show up in our own lives. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus says, after he has wrestled with the desires of the flesh in the wilderness. And that same Spirit, the one that was with Jesus when he uh, begins his ministry, that same Spirit hovered over the waters and the chaos in the creation and and animated the words of the prophets and the poets. That same Spirit that God gives us, right, strengthened Samson and clothed Gideon and set Ezekiel on his feet to speak defiantly to a rebellious nation. And that same spirit strengthened Mary, the mother of Jesus. And that same spirit at Jesus' baptism descends upon him and boldly and loudly proclaims him as beloved. That same spirit shows up on Pentecost. And friends, the best news of all is it's the same spirit that guides us now. She is moving and reordering our lives, inviting and encouraging us to live differently. We cannot cultivate maybe that fruit in ourselves, but the Spirit is cultivating the fruitful bounty in each of us. So as we live with this freedom and continue to challenge one another to see fruit in each other, may we trust that this process of sanctification is indeed taking place in our life because of the grace we find in Jesus Christ. And as we take these sticky steps in understanding it all, let us trust that the freedom that we have in Christ really does require a walk in the wilderness. But we do not stay in the wilderness forever. God is at work in your life. And I trust 
that we will begin to see the fruit of how the Spirit is moving amongst us very soon. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.